Watch it. Watch it. Fucking watch it. There's a very disturbing video going around on the internet caught on a Holmes ring camera of Steven Crowder, a conservative political commentator that was taken during the summer of 2021. The footage shows Crowder and his very pregnant wife having a disagreement over giving their dog its medicine. He claims she's violating a boundary by not performing her wifely duties when she expressed a concern over the health risks of a pregnant woman handling that medication. No, no, you just did, you just did it. I drew a boundary of abuse and control. You are not taking the card. Because if you refuse to do wifely things, then I will go pick up the groceries. There are no groceries. Hillary, how do you respond to me? No, you're not taking the car. Well, you're not taking the car. Second. You are not then taking the Then I will ask them to take the Uber. Would you like me to ask? Oh, no, you're not taking the car. Give an Uber. You want to walk out right now? Listen to me. I can't go to the gym. I can't go to my parents. I can't call my friends. I can't go. I can't be home. You're going to take the car and leave me here. Hillary, just think of how boxed in you've made me. What do you need me to pick up? I'll get it. I'll be back when I'm back. Do you I... understand the difference between my life being set to the second and you going to be back? The only way out of this. It's if the only way out of it, yeah. we're at an impact. Yeah, no, we are at an impact, okay? I love you, but Steven, Steven, you're a piece. He's sick. Watch it. He's sick. I love you very much. I don't love you. That's the big problem. I've never received love from you, and the fact is, when I go, look, I need an A, B, C, and D, just because I'm not a video. No. Become someone, someone, day in and day out, worthy of a white word. I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to engage anymore. I'm going to go. I'll get texts that you need. I'll get you to you. The dogs. Put on some gloves. Are you committed enough to get the medication the gloves? Have you noticed how it's nearly impossible to set a boundary with narcissists and other toxic people? In this video, I'm going to explain why and what you should do instead. Hi, I'm Dr. Carrie Kermack-Avoy, a mental health clinician and a narcissistic abuse survivor. And this is the 13th episode of Toxic Love. I remember when boundaries became all the rage. It was in the early 2000s, many of the most common interpersonal conflicts at that time were explained away as a simple failure of setting better limits. Whenever somebody complained about being exhausted or doing too much, they were told it was because they hadn't practiced assertiveness by failing to say no. We were told that healthy relationships should regularly reassess personal limits and develop stronger boundaries. But have you noticed though that it's not that simple? Take the example from the video of Steven Crowder. His wife reaches to pick up the car keys to run errands and he exclaims, You're not taking the car. You're not. She does the right thing though. She follows all the rules of setting a good boundary. She uses I statements and she calmly replies, Steven, I will ask someone to pick me up. Who would you like me to ask? Her voice is resolute and there's no hint of snarkiness or contempt. Any expert in boundaries will tell you that reasonable limits should be met with some type of a compromise. Like, no, don't bother, I'll take you. Or. Sure, that's fine. Or maybe even, You know what? Go ahead and use the car. I don't need it until later. But the conversation with Crowder goes into a completely different direction. In a menacing voice, he purrs, Is that a threat? And just like that, Crowder's wife's efforts to set her expectations are destroyed. In this video, you're going to learn why boundary setting with toxic people, and particularly with narcissists, doesn't work. And if you're facing this situation right now, you're going to want to stick around until the end when I reveal a better, though not easier way on how to handle these circumstances. This is a good time to hit the like button. And if you want to understand the ins and outs of narcissistic abuse, be sure to subscribe to this channel because each week I'm deconstructing a pathological love relationship from start to finish. And be sure to come back if you'd like a deeper psychological understanding of narcissistic personality disorder and why this abuse from these individuals is so incredibly and frighteningly effective. If you've read my book, Love You More, you know I faced a similar situation as Crowder's wife many times. One of the gravest errors I made in that relationship was I wrapped up my assets into a new company and then shared partnership with my then new husband. 
I had no idea at the time that he was narcissistic or dangerous. It was only after I experienced one betrayal after another that I'd realized I'd gotten in way over my head and I wanted a way out. But how could I get him to agree to a change of the company's ownership without him bankrupting me in the process. It wasn't until he got into a personal crisis of his own making and in a moment of weakness, he agrees to sign over his shares of the partnership to me. But it wouldn't be official until we signed the papers at the attorney's office. I, however, make a terrible mistake and go ahead and fulfill my end of the bargain before things are finalized, assuming he would do the right thing and do the same. <laughs> yep, you guessed it. He reneged. Once he got what he wanted, the subject was dropped as if the agreement had never been made. The problem is the practice of setting and maintaining boundaries assumes several key elements. We assume both parties will behave properly with civility. We also assume that any issue can be addressed without excessive drama or emotions that boundary breaches are easily identifiable and can be easily avoided, and that the parties don't ever need to reach consensus as long as they agree to disagree, and that all the consequences are simply a matter of carrying them out and don't pose much excessive risk to either party. But anyone who's attempted to set a limit with a narcissist or a toxic person knows that is not what happens. See, boundaries are an expression of autonomy and self-control. When we set them, we're informing the other person of our needs and expectations as an act of self-protection of our rights and desires. Now, is Steven Crowder a narcissist? I have no idea. I've never met the man. But Crowder's wife let Steven know that she didn't plan to give their dog the medicine and wanted to use the car. And in that moment, she was exerting control over her life by making those expectations clear. She made all the common assumptions that I had just outlined. But in one simple statement. Crowder blew her efforts by intensifying the moment and escalating her request to a threat. He refuses to back off his position and by the end of the conversation is swearing at her, saying, I will F you up. The loss of control to toxic people and narcissists is a serious psychological threat. And it doesn't matter how simple or small your request may be. It could be simply, please let me know when you get home. Because boundary setting robs toxic people of their sense of much needed control and power. It's like waving a red flag at a bullfight. It quickly escalates the situation. And toxic people will ignore, sabotage, or aggressively violate your simplest limits, all in an effort to let you know that you don't run the show, they do. So what are we supposed to do? Not set limits? Well, then that means we can become a pushover to their every want and whim, which skyrockets our vulnerability, leaving us open to being ignored, injured, and outright exploited. Yet taking them on directly also runs the risk of all-out war. So I'd like to suggest a different way of setting boundaries with toxic relationships. This assumes, though, that if you could have gotten out of the relationship, you would have, since the best boundary is to avoid toxic people whenever possible. But if you can't get out of this position, then I recommend you do this. First, define your boundaries from a perspective of what you're determined to do, not the behavior you expect in return. For example, instead of telling my friends and family not to call after 8 p.m., I put my phone on do not disturb every night at that time. See, the difference is I'm not taking calls versus I'm asking them not to call and then hoping that they follow through. Two, be clear with yourself why you need your limit so that you can become resolved in your willingness to follow it through. This step helps you to mentally prepare to take a firm stand. Number three, expect toxic people to become disrespectful, contemptuous, critical, or even hostile over your issue. And don't be surprised when this happens because it's going to. And finally, get ready for any and all possible consequences. Boundaries may instigate extreme conflict such as retaliation, revenge, and even violence. Steven Crowder's wife filed for divorce a few months later, stating in one of her last text messages to him that he scared her. Limit setting goes wrong when we expect reasonable behavior from unreasonable people. Instead, hold on to the knowledge that you're worth the respect and the fight and determine what you can and cannot do and follow through no matter the consequences. I know this is never easy, but it is the only way through this. Has this video been helpful in understanding the challenges around boundary and limit setting? If so, be sure to like it and stick around by subscribing to this channel.
And if you liked this episode, then check out last week's when I took a closer look at ambient abuse, the silent psychological torture of victims. And you're not going to want to miss next week's when I talk about why victims get trapped and can't leave abusive relationships. Hey, big hugs and stay strong and safe.